to chapter 21, verse 20. I want to share what Rashi says about this idea because we came across it in Dafyomi last week. It's a very important idea. If a man will strike his slave or his female slave with a staff, and he will die underneath his hand, then he shall surely be avenged. But if he will remain alive for one or two days, will you come? Then he shall not be avenged. Kikas Bohu, because he is his money. This is a very complicated law which we need to unpack. So that, let's let's go through this law. Basically, basically, there's two types of slaves in the Jewish tradition. Now, obviously, the whole idea of slavery is to to me is incredibly repugnant, a horrible concept, and why the Torah allows for it is a mystery to me, but the whole world had slavery until the 19th century. So the fact that the Torah had it is, you know, we're just, we're looking at it through enlightened eyes, but the whole world had it till the 19th century. So there are two types of slaves within the Jewish tradition. There's the Hebrew slave and the Canaanite slave. What we call the Hebrew slave is not really a slave it's more like uh, a worker who's hired to a long-term contract with you, who you have to feed, has to eat what you eat. If you strike them, you have to pay damages. They're, they're, they, 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 they sleep on the same type of bedding you sleep. You're responsible to pay their tuition for their children. That's the Hebrew slave. Very different type of slave, and that slave is only a slave for six years. There's another type of slave, which is what these verses are referring to. These verses are referring to a Canaanite slave. This is the non-Jewish slave which you have in your possession. Now, the non-Jewish slave, this slave is actually more similar to the type of slavery which we recognize when we read about pre-Civil War America, a slave which was a slave forever, a slave which did not have rights. But... Even though this was that type of slave, excuse me, we see from these verses that they did have rights, that they that they still ha- were recognized as human beings, and and in this formulation we see the underpinnings for the eventual abolition abolition of slavery. So first of all, we see that if you strike the slave and you kill them, then you're put to death. So if a master Anybody would strike the slave of the master, they'd be put to death. And the master himself, if he strikes a slave, he's also put to death. So that's a very powerful law. What this verse is telling us is that the master is not put to death if the slave, the master alone, has a special leniency. That if the slave lasts for what's called one or two days, yomo yomayim, which the oral law understands to be 24-hour period, then the master is not put to death for killing the slave. But if the if the slave dies within 24 hours, then the master would be put to death for the killing of his own slave. And we also know another law that relates to the Canaanite slave. And this is the law of what's called the Shein V'ayin. So if a master, in disciplining his slave, knocks out the tooth or the eye, of the slave or one of 24 other limbs, meaning to say that there are 24 parts of the body, which if the master knocks out, the slave automatically goes free. The slave automatically goes free. So we see from here that the slave was also seen as a human being. Again, the whole concept of slavery is repugnant. But within this, we see the the underpinnings of the eventual abolition. And in fact, there is a biblical prohibition against freeing a slave, but the Talmud tells us two two ways in which, two stories about this. One story is that a slave was freed. Now, the slave was was a quasi-Jew, 
and he couldn't count in a minion. But the slave was freed in order to make the minion, to be the tenth man. And we see from here that there's no biblical commandment to make a minion. But the rabbis felt that, that this was an opportunity to free a slave just in order to make a minion. And so that also shows us the rabbis violated this biblical commandment against uh, freeing the slave in order to make the minion. And in the Baba Kama recently, and two weeks ago, we did in the Dafyomi, that there was an interaction between Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Yoshua. The Rabbi Gamliel runs over to Rabbi Yoshua and he was overwhelmed with joy. He says, why are you so happy? He said, because I knocked out the tooth of, what was it? I, I not, I'm sure maybe it was the eye or the tooth of my slave. And now my slave is going to go free. Meaning to say that the rabbis were conflicted. They didn't want to violate the Torah, but they wanted their slaves to go free. And that just shows the, the, the anguish that they felt. They felt the biblical commandment, but, but Rabbi Gamil wanted desperately wanted his slave to be freed because he viewed his slave as a human being who was worthy of freedom, and yet he felt limited by the biblical, by the biblical commandment. And so that's something that I would just wanted to share that context within, within, the, within this portion. We don't have time to do everything, but I wanted to at least share one aspect of what we learned from Baba Kama with, with this passage. So I'll stop here. If anybody has any questions, happy to address.